Good morning. Welcome, everybody, back to another Breakthrough Real Estate Investing Podcast. We're very happy to have you today. And as always with me here is Sandy McKay. How's it going, Sandy? I'm uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, got the beard going, the summer 2020 beard, and uh, I'm feeling great, man. Nice. What, you can't get the barber, or is that just your... Um, I was on vacation last week a little bit, so I just kind of got a little little behind on it, then a little farther behind, and then I just said, you know what, let's just see how this works out. I'm looking at it. It's a little red, a little too red for my liking, but... No, I look good, man. You look... Uh, figure it out. What is, what is it? D d distinguished. Distinguished, yeah. yeah. Very, cla very classy. I actually... Uh, I didn't realize that we were doing this on video. I should have shaved beforehand, too, actually. But... No, we, all got the, we all got some stubble, so it's all good. Yeah, yeah. Except for 2020, that's how it goes. We have dropped him for some reason, but I'm sure he'll be back. There he is. Right, we got him. Yep, in there here. he is. We got him, man. And he's got to go yep. too. So well, it's okay. I didn't crash. I'm I'm safely parked. I should say that. <laughs> we were worried. So we got the two guys with no hair on this side, and the two guys with hair on that side. So oh, this perfect. works out. Work perfect. Works right. out perfect. Um. As always, everyone should go over to our website, Breakthrough REI Podcast. There you can download all of the episodes that we've done so far. We are working hard, guys, to get this podcast up on every um, different outlet that people use. Um, we are behind on some of them, I guess. Like We get requests every day to be to be available on, on this or that place to where people get their podcast. But for now, if it's not available where you usually listen to your podcast... I don't know how you'd be hearing this, but you uh, you can go over to our website and get everything there, and you get a free gift there as well, right, Sandy? Uh, they can also watch or listen on uh, Facebook Live uh, as we do these shows every Wednesday, ten thirty Eastern, or or YouTube as well, same time. And yeah, our website breakthroughrapodcast.ca. Uh, they can pick up our free gift, the ultimate strategy for building wealth through real estate. We, when you do that, you also get on our email list and uh, make sure you don't miss out on a show. Get notified of those as they come out and any events, property tours, uh, webinars, stuff like that that we got going on. And uh, just you know, get in our world a little deeper and learn a bit more about what we're up to and, uh, and come out and take us up on some opportunities to meet us in person. All sorts of good stuff. So go over and do that uh, if you haven't already and get on that list so you don't miss out. Yeah. And people have been super duper nice. We've gotten a lot of reviews lately. I'm not going to read them today. Maybe next show, I'm going to read some of these reviews, but we have gotten a few more. Read over. them all right now. Just read them all right now. Read them all right now. I don't have it up. That's why I did that. <laughs> I'll do it next time because I didn't have them up today. Uh, give me a second. No, no, you don't have, you don't have to read them all. He's just joking with you. <laughs> well, I'm, I, we, we've heard some pretty good things about you guys. Though, really like... nice ones. Although, um, yeah, no, I don't have it up. I don't have it up, guys. It's going to take me too long to get there. We'll read them next time. There were some nice ones there, though. I appreciate everyone who has left a rating and review. And as you all know, that helps us rank higher in iTunes and uh, and just get the show out there to more people who are looking for this kind of content. So thank you, everyone who's done that. We appreciate it a lot. Yeah, no, it's, it's good that you guys are doing this. Like, there's a, I'll find there's enough like Canadian-based opportunities for stuff like this. Oh, it's like uh, everything that I'm seeing online or like in books is typically US based. So mm, it's exactly. nice to see some boys that uh, we could actually talk to, to, uh, to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and well, there, there is a lot more now and we've had quite a few uh, different podcast hosts who are Canadian based on the show recently anyways, like they're popping up now. So it's nice to see more content, different, different views, Right, it's still targeted towards Canadians, and I think that's important for our show. It has been, anyways. So, right, so we're not going to talk about the 1031 exchange today. We're not going to do that. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Good. No 1031 exchange. No, no that, that... Mad, actually talking about 1031 exchanges makes me mad. So, I'd rather not. Talk about <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, uh, anything else we need to touch on first, Sandy, before we get into this? Hmm. You know what? Uh, we've covered all the, the basics, the usuals. I think we're pretty much ready to go. I mean, we got two awesome guests, so maybe we should just dive in and get going. And, um, you know, we're a different territory. We haven't really talked. Actually, we've talked to a couple people in, uh, in, in their neck of the woods, but not, uh, not much for a while. I think we've been kind of doing a bit of a cross country tour the last few months. We've been going all over the place, which is great. We get a lot of requests about, uh, people on getting people on the show from different uh, parts of the country. And, and, um, and yeah, still haven't found anywhere in Canada where the 1031 exchange works. So 
I guess uh, I don't think that it sounds like that doesn't work in uh, New Brunswick or Moncton either. So no, no. 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 Our only tax advantage is the double property tax, which is uh, great for cash flow. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I think we have a bit of an intro there, don't we, Sandy, for these guys? We'll yeah, let's read a little bit about, find out a little more about, about what these guys do, and and um, you know they are. In the real estate world, obviously investments, realtors, that sort of thing, um, purchased many homes over the years. Uh, I know, Sean, you've done a lot of rent to own uh, property purchases over the years as well and helped facilitate a lot of those agreements. Um, they work with sales, leasing, commercial properties, a lot of income income properties, industrial, retail office, et cetera. Um, Sean, you used to work with one of the largest real estate firms in Atlanta, Canada for several years. I think that was Avis and Young, is that right? Yeah, I was with, uh, I think it was probably uh, the Cushman and Wakefield that would have been Cushman one of the Wakefield. larger ones. Yeah, so yeah. I started out in commercial real estate. Well, I, I started out doing the rent to own stuff actually. And then once I got licensed in 2011, I went with a commercial real estate firm called uh, Cushman and Wakefield. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, uh, they're a fairly large organization. But uh, awesome. I got some, got some good training over at Avison as well. And you, uh, you also are you the president? You run one of the the biggest or maybe the largest uh, real estate investment clubs out there in Moncton. And so we're going to get more into that throughout the show as well. Hear a bit more about what that's all all about. And um, yeah, why don't you guys tell us a little more about what, what you guys do and what that looks like and uh, how you got into this real estate investing world? Yeah, introduce yeah. yourselves. Give us your names first because I don't think we did that properly yet. Actually, so we got okay. John Power and Cameron. What's your last name? Brio, and I'm glad you didn't say it because it's often said wrong because it's <laughs> spelt a bit different. I might yeah. say Brio or something like that. Brio, yeah, you know. Okay. Yeah, I That's always get I always get seen for my name instead of Sean. Is it S E A N? <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. It's funny that people do, and they'll even email me at my email with like, has it spelled correctly to actually get my email, and then they'll start off with a hi S H A W N. But I love how your name works with uh, with the team too, because you you run the power team out in Moncton. So yes, uh, sir. You guys could come on. So uh, let's Sean first. Why don't you start off and just give us a little bit about uh, what you do? Okay, good stuff. So I mean, you guys kind of gave like a bit of a breakdown on what it is that I've done in the past, but just kind of like a quick summary is uh, I actually I dove into the real estate world my very first time by being a newbie visiting the Moncton Rio, which is the group that uh, Cameron and I now lead. So there was a guy that came in from Ontario. He pitched the idea of being able to purchase real estate without any money out of your pocket. And I was just at a university and I didn't have um, any money at all. So I thought that that was great. So the little money that I did have, I paid him to be my mentor. And then that transitioned into me getting a property or uh, more of like a business partner. And then we just kind of cycled through purchasing real estate and it was all done without money out of my pocket. So I learned, you know, creative deals pretty quickly and easily, I guess you could say by mistake almost from kind of rubbing shoulders with the guys that already did know what they were doing. I just put my time and efforts into it while they taught me how to actually put it together. Um, and in the past I've done, uh, I've done private lending. I've done flips. I've done um, just long-term holds. But uh, when I first got my license, it would have been like in 2011, which would have been after I did the rent-to-own gig. Um, and I specialized in apartment buildings and other investment uh, commercial buildings only. Because Cushman and Wakefield, they, they don't do residential. Like they're not on MLS or like realtor.ca. It's all more so like uh, internal networking and like through like large corporations. So. I had teamed up with a guy that was doing it for 35 years and I just soaked up as much as I could from him. Um, and that led me to uh, only dealing with investors kind of like on a, on a regular basis. And then I found a lot of the, the people I was dealing with, they also wanted to flip homes. And because the companies that I was with before, they, they didn't necessarily tap into the more residential market. Um, and same with my private lending, like the private lending was doing a little bit more residential than it was commercial. So that's when I started selling houses. Um, that would have been about six years ago now. So we have a healthy balance of selling just kind of like reg residential homes, um, both for like your average consumer or as well as for people that are flipping homes. And as well as we're, we're selling quite a few apartment buildings these days too. Not so much on the commercial side of things, but uh, with Cameron on board, I think we could 
we could put a little bit more focus into that because we have the ability to do so just from the background from Cushman. So yeah, I'm excited that Cameron's on board and we'll see what kind of strategies he brings to the table for that stuff. Um, I don't know if that's kind of answers your question on my background or if you wanted that's me to perfect. chat more. I mean, we can dig into it a lot more. I have a question about something you said, but I think first we'll let uh, Cameron talk a little bit about what he's bringing to the table and what he's done so far in the past. So uh, welcome again, Cameron. Yeah, thanks, Rob. This is awesome to be on here. Uh, I do like that you guys are doing this. When I dove into this uh, a number of years ago, it was very tough to find any Canadian content that would really be focused to try to build on a strategy. Um, so I actually got into real estate investing kind of by way of self-development, self-improvement. Um, went to university, business degree, thought you needed to work until you died, and didn't really have uh, a solid plan. And when my first son learned, I got into self-development books, things that changed my mindset, there was a common theme that I noticed in a lot of them, and it, it kind of led to people that were buying and holding things and creating wealth through assets. And uh, by dumb luck, I stumbled on the Moncton Rio group, and I went there to ask as many stupid questions as I could, would go home, do some research online, and, and call people, sit for coffee. And during that time, uh, I had the opportunity to be involved with a highly driven sales organization that deals in the construction industry. So on one hand, I'm learning about investing. At the same time, I'm looking at uh, building developments, uh, new construction and residential and commercial, and thought, wow, there's something here where I could add value. And I'm fortunate enough to, to help and find deals with, with local building owners that are either tired of renting, uh, you know, need the cash today, and I've been able to align them uh, either on a management capacity or I set them up for sale. So it's uh, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, being a building owner myself, uh, getting involved in management of other people's assets, both for local owners and have the tenant investors. And it's given me a great perspective to understand dealing with tenants, uh, knowing the numbers of a great deal, and then trying to add value within the community through Rio. Okay, right on. So you guys actually met at that uh, at the Rio um, organization, is that right? Yeah, oh. we, we kind of we knew of each other beforehand. We actually both went to the same university, so we may have crossed paths through there. But like, we, we got to know each other a lot more through Rio for sure. And how long ago was that? We'll talk a little bit about the the club and and how you guys met and and that kind of thing. Yeah, so how long ago would that have been that you came to Rio, Cam? Uh, six years ago or so. Oh, wow. That's crazy. That's a long time. Yeah, so I, I, that's roughly when I would have stepped into place to, to become the president of that group, actually. Would have been about six years ago, so it would have been right at the beginning of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Rio group, like, it's it's probably similar to what you guys do here. Like, we'll we'll typically bring in professionals that are specialists within whatever category of uh, real estate investing, whether it be a lawyer, uh, an accountant, uh, a developer, a flipper, wholesaler, you know, whatever specialty that they bring to the table and just have them come and do their presentation on why their strategy works for them, how they got to where they are now and answer any questions to make sure that other people don't stumble upon the same mistakes that they would have. And just uh, so so that, that's the primary focus on the education aspect of things. But then um, we also just drive to like kind of connect with people. So if somebody's looking to something as simple as build a house, then we would connect them with one of the builders that's in the group. Or if someone's looking to get some electrical work done, then they connect with one of the electricians in the group and so on. So that's primarily the focus of the group is just through education and connections and learning from other people's mistakes. Um, that was a monthly meetup. And how are you guys dealing with the, um, everything that's been going on lately? Yeah, well, typically we take a break in the summertime anyways. Um, but from March, we did one uh, video like Zoom call. Should be doing more. But to be honest, like uh, we, we haven't really played with that format too much of like, 
going on Zoom. So I think we'll probably continue to keep on doing Zoom calls or something like this up until the point where like everybody's comfortable with being in larger groups all at one table. Cause I don't, I don't know what kind of social distancing this place is. It's kind of like a, I don't know how you would describe the Alma city club, but it's, it's a city club where like everybody could go. And but I, I don't know if the, the space itself will allow for enough spacing to, or for everybody to be there. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you guys still have meetups now or is it all just done through this? <laughs> no, everything's virtual. Virtual for now. Yeah. yeah. We're getting back to it. Once school maybe gets back in, that might be, might look differently. I'm thinking, um, how can yeah. people how can people learn more about that group? Is there you got a, guys got a website and stuff we can uh, yeah, point people towards? Uh, on Facebook, we do have a website. It's uh, it's going to be revamped in the next couple of weeks. It's in the agenda. But Facebook, uh, Moncton Rio R E I O, or Moncton Rio at Gmail dot com to be added to the blast email list. If you're not a Facebook user, um, we actually have had a lot of traffic recently where people have been asking, you know, who can I talk to? I've heard about Moncton. Uh, can we set up a call? Um, so I think organically, I mean, people that are looking to invest in smaller cities, uh, and I and I do like it, Sandy. You made us sound huge. We're we're not a big population by any means, but for uh, the last couple of months, let's even the last year, Moncton has been a hotbed for out of town investors. Mm. Yeah, it's and it's continuing to go in that way. A lot of the buyers that I'm seeing coming through for. Uh, for any of the investment properties, it's more and more becoming people that are not from the Moncton area, which is driving the prices up, right? Because people are, we're, we have a, a fairly healthy rate of return here in comparison to some other competitive cities where, yeah. you know, it's just more populated. Like our, just to give you an idea, I think the greater Moncton area as a whole is like what, 170,000 roughly can. Yep. Yeah. And like Moncton proper, the city is like 70,000 people. So we're, we're not a very big city by any means, but like this, this area, we're called the hub city. So it's, we have a lot of draws from other people, like um, in regards to transportation and retail and everything. So it's, it's a fairly stable economy here. Um, if you look at the Moncton area, it, it dates back quite a little while ago, but they, they went through some like economic transitions when like one of the main employers pulled out. Um, which Moncton kind of did a rebuild phase. And if you look at the, uh, the population, the last time I checked, there's not more than 10% of the population within one particular industry. So should any uh, industry actually collapse, it's not necessarily going to affect Moncton as a whole. And we, we've never really had the spikes in values around here. Like, and, and tell me if I'm jumping ahead here. but No, go ahead. No, no. Okay. So, yeah, like value-wise, like, we probably climb like. Did you guys lose them too? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, it's it's spotty. Uh, yeah, I think sorry. we're trying with. A call, oh, just came, a call just came in there, so I had to ignore it. Oh, um, but uh, yeah, so we probably go up or down in value like 1% to 3% per year on average. So we don't get like the huge 20% 20, 20 spikes that some of these other cities would have. Um, recently it's been the strongest seller's market that I've seen and values are starting to climb quite a bit. Like I think the, the average home price went up by like 8% this year so far. You know, I think for investors, something stable like that is great too. I mean, uh, appreciation is always great, but if you can get good cash flow because the values haven't spiked through the roof, then that's, that's something, you know, that's another positive for the area, right? Right. Yep, yeah, I agree. Um, on, uh, I, I guess we should mention it too. Um, on some web forms, it is highly publicized, but uh, we do have a double property tax within this province. So if it is outside of your primary residence, your tax rate is significantly higher. So even yeah. though the cost of entry can be lower, once you see the tax, that can affect your cash flow. And I guess in current years, there has been a group that has tried to lobby to try to get that addressed. And it was on the table for uh i guess this spring but obviously with covid their priorities have shifted yeah so a that lot of people... like, is, that, is that a double like literally double or is the, what do the numbers look like on that yeah it's i think like if it's owner occupied it's like a buck 56 per thousand dollars of assessment and then it's like if it's non-owner occupied it's like like three dollars and ten cents i i usually just use a three dollar mark um yeah. so like a hundred thousand dollar property you're looking at three thousand dollars worth of uh taxes 
there's talks like pre-COVID, they were they were talking about potentially abolishing some of that. My thoughts were that they were just going to do it on single dwelling homes. I don't think that'll ever come into play with the uh, the multi-res or like two units plus. It's just to kind of like encourage people to still own cottages um, or a secondary home for whatever reason. And it just so that they're not punished because it right now, as it stands, if you had a house plus a cottage, the cottage would be double property taxed. Right. Now, now keep in mind, our, our prices are pretty cheap here. So it's all relative. Like your, your cash flow is, is fairly strong here. Like I'm sure you've seen some of the numbers on the properties, Rob. Mm. Like your average cap rate is, it's probably closer to like 6.75 these days. So that's still a pretty strong cap rate when you're looking at the grand scheme of things, but property tax will be a point of uh, concern for some people. So that property tax is whether it's at, if you're at a province or foreign, it's, it applies obviously to all those, right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, a lot, it's just like uh, owner occupied or not. And then even if you are owner occupied uh, and you have a portion of it, that's not owner occupied, it's, it's done on a percentage basis. So, like if you have like a, a duplex, for example, and you're in one unit and they're 50% of the total square footage each, then 50% of your assessed value will be double property taxed. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, like our, I, I, I'd have to double check on the average sale price. Um, I would say it's close to maybe 200,000 right now. But like just to give people like a, an idea on things, like you could pick up like a, a nice six unit renovated for, you know, four, four fifty here. So I don't know. What's it like in your guys' market for like a, a nicely renovated place? I'll let you take that uh, one, Sandy. Well, six unit, um, nicely renovated, 1.2. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a, a bit hundred, different. Couple, maybe, maybe more like a couple hundred grand a door at least. Um, if you're, 450 if it was a six unit for 450 it's falling over yeah <laughs> no yeah and i've seen that like I, I was actually in toronto there not too long ago and there's a place and i was in the beaches so i'm sure you guys know these areas but uh anyways that when i was there it was a piece of junk like it would be like a sixty thousand dollar property in moncton <laughs> at that point in time and i think it sold for over a million because it was a double lot yeah double lot in, in that area for sure yeah, I mean, great. we're not even we're both outside of Toronto, we're, you know, Hamilton for me and uh, and the east side Durham and, and Oshawa, that area for Rob, like we're in the cheaper areas. So, you know, when I'm saying 1.2, that's 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 cheap really, oh, wow. compar comparatively to the rest of GTA. So, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm not here to like kind of like like everybody markets difference. My, my purpose for bringing that up is that the double property taxes aren't necessarily a, a large pain point when you look at our, our entry level pricing, right? So it's, yeah. it's all relative. It all works out in the end. The cat, the cash flow is what's the important topic here and, and our cash flow is good here. Okay. So um, let's go back. I just wanted to ask you real quick. We'll, we'll jump back and take it from there. Now, when you were, you were doing your uh, intro, you mentioned that you started out by doing creative strategies and that was, uh, I guess, a matter of necessity, right? So let's jump right back to there and talk about some of those strategies you employed and, and uh, how they worked out for you. Just like sort of walk us through how you got started and, and, uh, and your progression. Yeah, for sure. So I, um, I hired a guy from, I think he was in Ottawa and he was pitching the idea of what's called like a sandwich leasing. So, mm -hmm you would typically you would approach a vendor that's looking to sell but doesn't mind holding on to it for a while and then actually getting the sale price at the back end so i would go and i would convince those people um it was even easier if somebody was actually renting it out already i would go to kijiji and i would find homes that were actually for rent because the mindset of those individuals they're already prepared to let somebody rent from them and if you give anybody the right price, they're typically open to selling it, right? So I, I would approach either or the people that are privately trying to selling it or privately trying to rent it and convince them to give me rent with an option to purchase agreement. So let's say the rent was a thousand bucks just for simplicity's sake. Um, and I told them that I would be willing to purchase that place for $100,000. I would then go out and find somebody else that's uh, interested in doing a rent to own 
and rent it out to them for, let's say, $1,200. And I would sell it to them for $120,000 at the back end. So I, I would make a spread of $200 per month. And if and when they actually purchase it at the, the end of the line, I would make a positive 20K uh, from the, the amped up sale price. So I did a few of those. And then I would also just go find a qualified client. So I, I would qualify them through mortgage brokers to make sure that they were actually like capable of purchasing within the next few years. And like a lot of these people were like, you know, they had good cash flow. They're respectable people. They just went through like an unfortunate situation such as a divorce. Um, and so they had the money and the ability. They just didn't have the right credit. So I would find a good client like that, qualify them through a mortgage broker and say, okay, go out and find any house on the market that you think you could call your home. And once they found that property, I would pull in an investor. That investor would acquire that piece of real estate for that purchaser. And then the same scenario would happen. They would lease it to me for $1 amount and I would sublease it for a higher dollar amount and sell it to me for $1 amount. And I would sell it to the purchaser for a, a little bit of a higher of a dollar amount. So I was controlling the cash flow without having to put any money out of my pocket. Okay, great. Yeah. Like, I mean, those are, those are, I would say among the trickier of things to pull off, especially when you're first starting out. So congratulations for, uh, for, you know, sticking with it because I mean, there's, a, there's so many people that hear about those kind of strategies, right. And want to get started and, uh, and they don't push through, you know, and then make it work. Yeah. I, I think my luck came from lack of knowledge. Like I, I didn't know enough about the real estate to know that this was hard to do. So I just went in assuming that it could be done and just kind of pushed through. Cause literally when I was at the Rio group, everybody was coming down on the guy that was doing the presentation. Like, Oh, you can't do that here. Like that's never going to work. And I was thinking like, who are these guys? Like, this seems like the big sense to me. And again, I, I was excited that I could buy real estate without money out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I probably had like $2,000 to my name at that point in time. And, my university debt and still living at home at my parents. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Push through. That's it is. Those are tough strategies to make work in most markets, uh, but totally doable. Yeah. So yeah, it, it worked out pretty well. And then like uh, just through like, I, I eventually I ended up starting up a private lending company because I, I was building up my own cash and people would come to me for kind of like small short-term loans. So I'd do it. Uh, and eventually I just ran out of my own money. So other people kept on coming to me and asking me for money. And I had investor clients because I was selling apartment buildings. So I just made the connection between the investor and the person who was looking to purchase. Um, and kind of structure like a private lending through that means, which eventually formed into a company. And again, helped build my knowledge on like how people are flipping homes without money out of their pocket and using other people's money. So it's, uh, you know, when you, when you do these different things all along, you just start building up your ability to pull deals together, like, and get more creatively. All right, Cameron, let's talk about how you got started in uh, real estate. You, I guess, uh, well, go ahead. Tell us about how you got started. Sure. Uh, well, I thought that the, uh, the easiest way was to maybe house hack. Um, there's a lot of semi-detached or duplex properties. Buy both sides, live in one, renovate, flip-flop, uh, refinance it, then do it again. Uh, with two small kids, that's almost impossible to convince anyone to do. Hmm. So I, uh, I just started looking for properties with a lot of equity off the hop. I would run the numbers very conservatively. Uh, and if the right deal didn't come through on paper, I would just let it pass. So um, through savings, uh, some creative uh, strategies as a banker, I was able to have enough to buy a six unit um, that was very, very underperforming in the market, an area of town that is currently still in transition. And I kind of saw what it could be. So I had actually on paper built a five-year plan with what it would look like buy it at one price year one do this year two uh so it was everything from addressing tenant issues with the rent uh utilities that was something that needed to be addressed 
and then basic things within the property that just needed updating that would make the tenants feel a little bit better uh, before moving into any of the hardcore big building system upgrades um, before refinance. Because the idea was to get it to a certain point, pull all of that money out, and then replicate it as I've already found a deal, kind of prepared in the wings, and then move on to it. Um, so yeah, I got started by just savings, you know, using uh, the HELOC method. I owned a primary residence that mortgage was paid down, had a little bit of savings, so that was enough, and um, it seemed to work out quite well. I mean, I would say that that's probably the easiest way for somebody that's established themselves in their career, that's put some money aside to uh, to hop into real estate. Hmm. Yeah, it is pretty hard to. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on on uh, certain things, but my wife is sort of the same way because I would always back when we started float the idea of oh, let's move into a junker, let's fix it up while we live there, and and uh, you know sell it and move to the next one, and that never flew, hmm. never yeah. flew for us. So we had to just uh, either flip them or or hold on to them, but as as not our principal residence. But I always wanted to do that too, just never happened. Yeah, I mean, on, on paper and in theory, it's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's young in real estate uh, that likes the idea, I would say get involved that way. You know, you, you, you have a buddy from high school or college or university, ask them to live with you. Uh, they don't mind a, a reno and a mess. Cheap rent will help them pay the bill and uh, just replicate that. Because in our market, it's, it's one of the easier strategies to pull off. So can you guys talk about what were some of the biggest challenges maybe each individually? What, what were the, um, yeah, one or two like really big challenges they had to overcome and, and what did that look like starting out primarily or, or, or maybe even nowadays, what were some of the biggest things? For me, it was dealing with Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, uh, Cam, maybe I'll let you go first. really tough to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say it would be the limiting belief mindset, right? I can't do it. I can't find the money and then getting stuck on the fact that you can buy real estate uh, with somebody else's money. You can, but just not on your first deal successfully. It's very challenging, right? Because any new investor really doesn't have a track record to, to pitch to their, their rich uncle or their neighbor that's, you know, retired. Um, a lot of people that come to Rio ask, you know, what Sean actually was successful in doing, but it is challenging. Um, you, you do need to get a little bit of experience. You can buy real estate without money of your own, but it's, uh, it's unique and challenging for sure. Well, I think those strategies, especially the ones that uh, Sean was talking about there, along with like maybe wholesaling are, are the ones that you truly can get into without any money. So those are, those are, you know, super exciting for somebody who's got the ambition to sit down and actually try to make them work, then that is fantastic. But I agree. If you want to hang on to something and, and uh, you want to be the, the working partner for someone bringing the money to the deal, then you definitely need to have some kind of, uh, some kind of a track record, a background of why they should be investing their money into you. Um, Absolutely. What you're bringing to the table. So I think that a lot of people do get hyped up from some of the, the YouTube gurus. They click on the link uh, before bed and they think, oh, I've, I've made it. I'm going to quit my job on Monday and uh, this, this is it. I, I've, I've found a plan. I would say it, if they've got the work ethic and drive, yeah, do one deal, make a mistake, learn as much as you possibly can. And then by all means, come to meetings, make connections through uh, podcast comments all of those things would be great tools to elevate you and your profile. Um, but yeah, for me, honestly, it was the mindset that I, you know, how am I going to do it? How am I going to execute this? How am I going to fit it into the schedule? And then how did you overcome that? What did you do? Just, just plan it. You know, uh, if you've got a driving passion and desire, you find a way to make it work, right? You know, you, you cut the grass uh, yourself once, then you realize, okay, it's, it's going to be X amount. I'm going to hire that out. And you just get over it and work it into your weekly and daily plan. You know, if you have to schedule an appointment or a showing, leverage a professional to help you where needed, learn from your uh, your mistakes, and just keep good notes along the way. Right on, right on. And I would say probably your group that you joined is a big part of that, right? Because you'll meet lots of people there that have that same mindset, can actually say to you, 
you know, when the, when those people do say, uh, no, that can't be done. There's a, there's an equal amount, if not more people at a group like that, they'll say, yeah, of course you can do that. Absolutely. Without question. And I think that's one of the magical things about, uh, meeting like-minded people that are on different ends of the spectrum. You really get to see, um, where you were, what you could learn, and then set new goals for yourself. And uh, we've seen a few people that have really taken great action. Uh, some people still come, you know, asking the same questions, waiting on the fence. I'm waiting for the perfect deal. They want to see a certain dollar amount cash flow uh, per door. All of those things are great. And uh, I would say the group tries to elevate everybody to, to do a little bit more. Right on, right on. So now you both are working together. I guess you're specializing in, in slightly different uh, focus areas. Um, uh, so did you want to explain maybe, Cameron, what your specialty is? Yeah. Um, so the, the goal would be to find phenomenal opportunities for investors that want to partner with us to own a duplex, triplex, multifamily. Um, so my goal is to try to bring those deals to the table that are, are otherwise not uncovered. And uh, we, we do have a lot of people that are reaching out to us, asking to be either put on lists or kept abreast of the deals with the numbers. Everybody seems to have a specific set of criteria. Uh, so, so far, yeah, I mean, the hopper is, is getting full with opportunity. And... Um, Adding value would be just making those calls, trying to sit down with those potential sellers. And if it's not now, when? Keeping us in mind uh, as a team of folks that can get the job done for them and alleviate some stress in their world. And I guess you probably work with all different kinds of uh, properties, but what is your, is there, is there one main thing that you guys do? Is it like a duplexing of single families or is it multis? What, what's your thing? I would say that the multifamily would be the, the sweet spot um, just by way of construction. The, the duplex format is common in our area. I mean, I think in Southern Ontario, the row house or townhomes are, are equivalent in single family to uh, comparison. Um, but yeah, the, the four, five, six, 12 units, uh, there's a lot of them, brick build walk-ups that, uh, that Sean had mentioned, you know, renovated could go for a, a two for one special in Ontario, but mm -hmm. for right here, there's a lot of room for improvement. Traditionally, they are sixties construction uh, and a lot of them are owned, you know, two owners max. And there's still a lot of room to improve the asset as well as the rents and uh, you know, fit within the community because people yeah. still are looking for affordable housing uh, in the right area to their work, public transpo and all of that. And, I mean, if you look at Moncton on a map, uh, we do have a highway that is a semicircle, and we've kind of grown out from that semicircle. And those are the desirable single-family neighborhoods. But within the city center, you know, people still like to walk and bike and be uh, involved. It's not somewhere so, where you don't want to walk and bike. I guess is is your point. Downtown is basically. actually okay. <laughs> yeah, we're a pretty safe yep, city here, right? Like. I was saying to Cameron before, like uh, we've recently been rated as like one of the most honest cities in Canada and you get some weird foot traffic around here, but you don't necessarily get any, you don't get much violence here. Like I, I'm comfortable walking on any street at any point in time. Maybe a little bit different if, um, you know, for somebody else that uh, couldn't necessarily like run as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's a very safe city. And uh, it's it's not a very old city either, right? Like we don't have many century homes. Like when Cam was saying, the typical house that we sell is from the '60s. Like it's it's 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. You guys probably have quite a few older homes there, right? Yeah, especially in Hamilton, right, Sandy? Yeah, 150 <laughs> years so up to 150 years. Yeah. Yeah, there's not too many hundred plus year old properties in this area. You know, I stayed in Moncton about uh, 10 years ago. We went out to Nova Scotia and um, and there was a we didn't know about this, but I got the opportunity to stay in probably the worst motel that Moncton has to offer uh, Yeah, uh, because there was an ACDC concert that day. 
and we didn't know. So there was oh. no, couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> a hotel anywhere. Right. Okay. So, so we ended up uh, in not such a desirable uh, location, but, uh, but the city is very nice. Is yeah. Yeah. Say. We were Nothing out, got, we were you didn't out. get anything stole or broken no, or anything like that no, though. It was just, yeah. um, were you charged by the hour? <laughs> not for the hour no so maybe not the worst one i don't know okay um, okay what's the what is the in that city so let's if i've been to all three but i'm curious what's the like the three major cities there in new brunswick so st john i guess Fredericton, moncton yeah what's the been. if someone's looking from outside there and they're looking at investing into new brunswick somewhere and they're looking at those three what, what would be the like uh, reason to go to moncton as opposed to those three can you do a little little sales pitch on moncton uh, from an investor standpoint yeah, I mean, like we're we're pretty biased being from here, right? Like Frankton has always been a little bit more expensive than the Moncton market, um, and I think that primarily had to do with like uh, people fighting over student rentals, because it's a very strong student rental city um, as well as a government city. So your your price per unit is typically quite a bit higher there, and for it to make sense for you to invest in that market, you typically are getting into the student rental game. So. Uh, I, I find pe people are usually coming towards here cause it's a little bit cheaper. Um, and you don't necessarily have to cater towards the student rental. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the Franklin area that they don't invest into the student market and they do just fine. But, uh, that's been kind of the feedback that I've gotten from quite a few people and St. John, again, I, I don't like to talk bad about any city, but like, I'm always trying to pull people towards Moncton instead, but uh, St. John has like a bit of a cluster of fire code issues. So, and they also have some not so desirable areas in town. Um, so you really got to know what you're getting into before you purchase. Like I've had one friend, it was something stupid. Like he bought like eight units for like 120,000. It, it was something like that. It was like a six unit and a two unit. Anyways, he just tried to dump it after the fact because he's like the, the fire code issues is such a like you'll you'll have to put way too much money into the property than it's worth. And then at the same time, he later found out that it wasn't necessarily a, an area of town where you could get even close to a class rentals. So he has to put all this a class type of finishes to bring it up to the fire code and he's not going to be able to attain those a class uh, tenants. So I, I've seen that example quite a bit of times in the St. John market. But again, there's, they've got some very beautiful areas in St. John, like a lot of waterfront properties at a good price. And if you know what you're doing, I feel like you could get your best bang for your buck in St. John. It just comes with higher risk. And then Moncton is just kind of like the in-between, easygoing, pretty well-priced, very stable market. We don't depend on anything in particular. Uh, for industry wise and uh, values are typically slowly going up each year. So it's, it's just a lot more stable in my opinion. What, what's your yeah, thoughts guess, on that, Kim? Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, St. John also had some pretty strict regulations with uh, town planning city council with building. Yeah. And it wasn't until 2019 where they're really able to get some marquee projects off the ground uh, in historic type buildings uh, in the uptown area, which is close to their, their downtown where the cruise ships come in. And that was the area that had attracted a lot of folks that were seeing, you know, four or five, six units for a hundred grand. Uh, they're mostly built of sawdust and needed a lot of work and or the tenant that you could get in one that was habitable, not going to last or they're going to provide more damage than what it's worth. Um, but Moncton is actually comprised of three cities, so Moncton, Dieppe, and Riverview, uh, three unique communities that offer um, a lot of different flavor with rental rates, with opportunity for development, um, and the three cities seem to really want to foster that growth of people coming from the northern coastal communities down. Uh, so there are some employers that have closed their office, let's say in Bathurst, which is far north. They've moved their workforce here, so we're getting that. And then we are getting a spike of immigration where whole families are landing or uh, maybe the husband is coming here, gaining work, and then bringing the rest of the family over. So a lot of that is really fueling investors to take the time to improve the asset. So there's a lot of factors at play that are really benefiting our community. 
as a whole that I would say maybe six to 10 years ago just were not existent. I mean, for whatever reason, I think you guys, you guys have like a, a more of a tourist draw too, don't you? Like, I mean, you do have maybe not right now, but a lot of those concerts and that kind of thing going on out there. Yeah. And that yeah. kind of pulls on the whole concept of the, the hub city too, right? Like it, it stems from, retail retails being very strong so then that brings in the hotels which also brings in more people in general uh so we, we've got good concert sites a water park a zoo uh we used to have an indoor uh, play park with like roller coasters and stuff but that recently got changed into a bass pro but yeah we, we are the hub city right so everybody in this in the surrounding area typically travels here for their fun or their concerts or their shopping not to mention the, the ocean and the beaches, yeah, absolutely. And I would say that Airbnb has presented a very unique opportunity for people with seasonal rentals and or units in their home that they're they're willing to kind of let people have for a weekend or a couple of nights and uh, has really kind of changed the flavor for what we see in how people can invest. Uh, and then it also brings back the concept of how to get in with very little money. I know as a property manager, I've gotten tons of emails from folks that disclose, I'm Jimmy, I'm operating an Airbnb business. Would you be comfortable with X rental rate? These are my terms. And uh, a lot of people are very successful with that. So for um, an investment standpoint, I would say there's there's a lot that you can dive into. If you want to do a full-time, part-time, seasonally, however you want to fit it in. I think it's uh, it's presenting a very unique opportunity. Uh, property management too is a little bit, I, I don't know if you, I assume you might know a little bit about Ontario and other provinces maybe. And obviously there, I think there's some advantages there from what I've heard, uh, as far as the, um, tenant laws and things like that. Is, kind of thing. Can you, yeah. Can you speak to a few of those things and maybe some advantages as to why someone might want to invest their money there as opposed yeah, to I Ontario? Guess the, really? First, first and foremost is, um, the rent uh, structure is, is not the same as, as other Atlantic provinces or even in Ontario. Uh, three months notice is what you're required to give. So if it's a long-term tenant and or a one-year lease under contract, three months is what you would give. Month to month, 30 days after their first year is acceptable. Uh, so an investor coming in that perhaps sees an opportunity to raise rent, they're not caught in a lot of the red tape that others are. Uh, in other provinces. And I know that that's been beneficial to some that are coming in, buying a place that really needs some attention. And they're, they're even just renovating it, but putting the rents at, at market, right? They're not going crazy to try to, you know, make a bunch of money right off the hop, but they're coming in, they're doing the right work. And then they're, uh, they're, they're getting either the same tenant or a better tenant in there. Because I know that some tenants are long-term. You come to them and say, I want to repaint. I want to do the floor. Unit number two is going to be ready in three or four weeks. Would be open to moving. A lot of them will say yes. Hmm. So yeah. it's rather unique where you're not caught in the, uh, it's called the rentalsman here, uh, in any bureaucracy that they have. They are here to assist if you do have a tenancy dispute. Uh, and that's typically damage and unpaid rent. Those are the, the two big ones that you'd really want to engage them on. Um, but I have heard some stories about Hamilton and Toronto where you know, you're kind of stuck with somebody. Yeah. Maybe you want to comment on the, um, the process if somebody doesn't pay because it, it's, it's within a month you could kick out your tenant if they're not paying here. Yeah. So uh, on the second day of the month, so if rent is due on the first as stated in your lease, on the second day of the month, you can serve them with a notice and that notice you essentially uh, serve in person and or whatever preferred contact you mentioned in the lease. You have to present that same copy on the same day by email to the rentalsman board. Uh, you get a confirmation generated by just a, a bot. And then within three or four days, you actually get somebody that can contact you and ask if it's been resolved. So the tenant has 15 days to, to right the wrong, whether that's late rent or damage. At that point, it's your rent plus any late fee. Uh, and then if the 15 days passes, then you can start the eviction process where then um, the sheriff could get involved with the approval of the uh, rentalsman. Yeah, and so, then so that next by what month, date? That, sorry, on the 15th day of the month. But like what date will the, 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 so by the 15th, was that when the uh, the sheriff would show up to kick him out or what, what date would uh, it be? No, where they so, 
they would slot you in based on scheduling and availability. So sometimes it's not a, an exact science. And with COVID, I know that it's been even more so delayed. Hmm. Um, so typically it's a 30 day process that you're looking at. Yeah. If all yeah. things go according to plan. Yeah. You know what? That's virtually identical to what we have here. Actually. Okay. Um, yeah, but we're not getting people out in 30 days. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we're not. Because, again, it, it's based on scheduling and everything like that. But my, you know, when I've had to do it, it's actually went quite smoothly. Um, haven't had to do it during COVID times. All my tenants have been paying. So that, that's good. That has been great. Amazing. Um, but, you know, when I've had to, I found the process here was not so bad either. You know, yep. uh, and it's virtually identical. Second day. I mean, your forms are probably different, whatever form you have to, uh, whatever form you have to send them. Uh, and then they've got 15 days to correct it. And then you can go typically what you want to do here though, is you'll want to go and, um, like adjudicate some, you know, sit down with them and try to, you know, that's what they encourage you to do. It's not, it's not just straight. No, I want them out kind of thing. I find though, once you have it in writing and you've served it in some fashion, then you have a bit of value in the conversation to help them understand what the process is mm-hmm. uh, or else in our province. So if you pay on the 14th day in full with the late fee, the, the clock starts again. So this could be a recurring thing for a tenant to kind of abuse the system that's there to protect them. Uh, so that, that has been frustrating to some landlords and property managers and um I haven't had to run into that, but I know that there are people that they kind of use and abuse the system that way. So, you know, they basically get a couple of free months of rent every year if if they just keep moving. Mm -hmm. And tenancy screenings aren't always linked on the back end to find out if they have been evicted from a property. I mean, uh, I've used the service tenant cloud and uh, I did see once a tenant had admitted to that. We actually spoke about it. Situation was, was a common one. Boyfriend left, couldn't pay the rent, nowhere to go. There was a child involved. What do you do? Well, we couldn't pay, so we were evicted. Mm. Uh, They're upfront and honest, and uh, they're actually a great tenant, believe it or not. But the checks and balances, pardon me? No, sorry. I was just going to say, I'm just looking on Facebook, and we've got a a comment here. David Belanger says, you must have great tenants, Rob. Well, I'm not saying there hasn't been hiccups, so don't get me wrong. (laughs) <laughs> I've had to make negotiations with tenants and you know, everything hasn't been 100% perfect. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend that that's the case. Maybe they're just afraid of you. Yeah. I, I, I kind of doubt it, but, uh, <laughs> but no. I Show mean, up with your dog in a baseball bat. There's always hiccups, right? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I, I, we've worked with our tenants to make sure that we come up with something that, that they, that they can make, you know, that's doable for them in the situation. Yeah. That we're in, so. yeah and you pretty much have to because you're, yeah. Cause otherwise you're waiting until we're waiting until like June at this point, like next June, like to get anyone out of this, like there's not, it's going to take a year plus with the backups and the no evictions for whatever the term has been. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's going to be a nightmare. If you don't now, in Ontario, them. are you, how, how does your damage or security deposits work? Is it like, do you last hold the last rent. month's rent? Okay. So here you actually, it's a security deposit for the building and it's held by the government. So we would remit it through a web portal. They would take the money from the landlord's account. And then that would be tied to the tenant's name. They receive a tenancy number and a letter in the mail. And upon moving out, if there is damage, the landlord actually has to go through, apply for it, document and prove to be able to get any of those monies back. So you right so I, really have to pay double property tax. You got yeah. <laughs> yeah. So much admin. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the how much fines, can you take though? How much can you, can you, is it a uh, negotiable? No more or? than one month's rent. Oh. No more. So I mean, oh, that's back, son. you had a $1,500 a month unit. I mean, $1,500 is probably very nice, well appointed. So let's say they ripped a the dishwasher out and damaged your refrigerator which can happen, uh, you know, you're paying out of pocket or the owner's paying out of pocket. Yeah, you could still take them to small claims if you wish, though, eh? Yep. So oh, you yeah. You could go through question. that. Pro- it's it's a headache, and they say, like, good luck getting blood from a stone, but yeah. you could still take them to small claims and try to seek any damages. So do you take... Yeah, a- one of the... Sorry, real quick. Do you take security deposit and first and last? 
You can't. You can't. No, it's just the one. damage. Just the damage. Well, that's good. At least, I mean, it's it's specifically uh, put aside for that. So, at the yeah. property. So, for example, if, if you're an out of town investor, uh, you hire Sean to manage. He decides, you know, he's out of the business, and I take over. Uh, there's a transfer, and it's already all done. It's very seamless. So, in that regard. Uh, it is a slick process because if it was, let's say, a 24-unit apartment building and the deposits are always in and out, you'd then have to close the books on that, cut a check to probably the lawyer, and then put it on your side, which, I mean, you know, there's always going to be a debate about who paid, who didn't pay. Oh, I waived that guy, and then he's calling in a year looking for his money. So I could see that being a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when people are closing on properties, they'll actually make – all the tenants sign a document proving that they didn't necessarily have a deposit or they did in what dollar amount, as well as any items within the property that they may own, such as appliances or whatnot. So that way you don't acquire a property where you think they have zero damage deposits and come out to find that everybody has, you know, one month rent on their damage deposits. So you could go about that if you're acquiring a property to give some like extra layer of protection. Typically, it's in the lease, though. It, sh it should be in the lease itself, and that would stand. You know, this has been really informative, guys. I um, want to thank you for everything that you've shared. Let's talk about, finally here, um, what's next for you guys? What are your big plans for the future? Uh, just keep on growing, really. Like, uh, we're enjoying what we're doing, um, primarily on the sales side of things, really, like both being realtors. Um, so we're a team of four now. There's us, and uh, my father actually worked with us, and we have an assistant. So, I mean, last year we sold probably close to, it would be like in your mid-90s. So we sold almost 100 units last year, like uh, 100 deals, um, several hundred units for sure. So we just keep on looking to do bigger and better deals. Um, on the investment side of things, though, like uh, my wife and I are, we're looking at acquiring like a, maybe 12 plus units here pretty soon. Um, she's a self-employed individual. So we're both incorporated and have our money within that. So we'll just use our corp to go and buy a, a property together. Um, and other than that, we're, we're pretty long-term focused. Like we're, we're both fairly young. We're from the city. It's a city that's so small that like your name is very important, right? So if, if you're not good at what you do, or if you are not truthful to people, the word travels very quickly. So we're always focusing on keeping our, our name and our brands to the most premium that we can. I don't know. Does that answer kind of your question on growth? Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Now, Cameron, what are you going to, what, what do you, what are your big plans? Uh, honestly, to see if I can, uh, I guess I would do myself with bringing enough deals to the table to satisfy all of the investor clients. I find that we've, uh, We've reached a point where we're a value add team member to an investor. They can come to us with their budget, their expectation. We can find the suitable property that, that checks all of those boxes. So if all of those boxes can be checked and all the investors are happy, then I would say that uh, growth mode is happening and we've achieved the goals, especially the ones that I'm setting up for myself. That's fantastic. I think that's the probably the best problem to have is too many investors and not enough properties. Probably. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a problem. We we need to we need more sellers out here. <laughs> yeah, no, we're making calls daily, and it's it's funny, you know, people that were considering selling in this market, they're seeing an opportunity. Their dream numbers are coming across the table, and you know, if we can make it happen for them, then we've done our job. Um, with with the Rio hat on, it's definitely find the people that can add value in your team. Uh, I know that I did it in the beginning. You know, you want to find, so you're calling all the realtors, you're calling owners yourself. That's a really good way to detract from actually winning. Uh, I find that if you have the right individuals in place, they're going to help you find and uncover and probably get you a better deal than you can get on your own. Uh, and again, that was a lesson that I learned myself, which is why you know, I'm working with Sean doing this now, because I see that it's incredibly valuable. Awesome. Okay. Well, again, thanks guys. You know, this has been really good. I think that they're going to have some people reaching out to you and, and wanting to learn more about the market. So, um, appreciate it. I yeah. think so. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. What's, so uh, what's, what's, what's to wrap up? Like what's, uh, any final words and then like, uh, how do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about Moncton or about you guys and your businesses? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I, they could go to our website, powerteam.ca, or they could uh, email our assistant. Uh, it's info at powerteam.ca, and she'll just move the uh, the ball forward with either myself or Cam or actually my father as well. Um, alternatively, you can call my cell directly. It's uh, 506-229-7711. And Cam, maybe I'll, I don't know, I have your number memorized. Uh, 506 899 call or text. And uh, if you want to find out more about the market, talk shop. I mean, we're, we're doing it all day, every day. So might as well uh, keep the ball rolling. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, all, all those contact uh, points will be in the show notes. So anyone that wants to reach out to these guys, you know how to get there. Just go to the website and, uh, and, and click on the show notes and you'll see all of those options right there. Sandy, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, two eight nine three eight nine six eight four six or Sandy at McKay Realty Network dot com. You can reach me at Rob at Mr Breakthrough dot ca. So thanks again, guys. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, Thank you. Good to see you again. And uh, I guess everybody will see you next time. Thank you very much. Good job, you guys. <laughs>